Very warm blessings to one and all in the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Now, tonight, we'll move to another beatitude, and that is about blessed are they that moan. Blessed are they that moan. Now, before we go further, let us all go to God in prayer. Eternal God, our gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for journey mercies to thy house, and we thank you especially for this great blessedness as thy people, thy children, that we can gather midweek, Lord, to raise our hymns of praises to you, to crown you as our God and our King, and to, Lord, to sing and plead with you in prayer, even to ask, Lord, that you hear our singing, that we may tear down every idol in our hearts, Lord, that we may serve only you. O Lord, what blessedness you have afforded thy children to in this place of rest, Lord, where we can be away from the um, molestations of sins of the world and be lost in your presence, worshipping you. And Lord, now to receive your word and thereafter to seek your face, to commune with you. O Lord, truly, only thy children know of this blessedness. And we come, Father, once again, asking that you cleanse us, wash us thoroughly of all our sins. And Lord, we do plead with you that your Holy Spirit will work a mighty work of illuminating, granting understanding of this beatitude, but above all, O Lord, that he would work in our hearts conviction of sin, of a desire, O Lord, to depart from sin. And Father, we pray that you remove all the tiredness of the body, the labors, um, the day of um, labor and um, worries that may cloud our minds and draw our hearts, Lord, and minds to your word alone. So speak, O God, we pray mightily. Transform our lives for thy namesake. Lord, we pray that both young and elderly alike would understand. And Lord, we pray for all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight, we move to this particular Beatitude, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now, we live in an age and time where it is very difficult. Life is very, very difficult. Just reading the news, we notice that, well, things are very difficult financially for many people in Australia alone. People can't even afford to live, to rent a place, rent a room. They, li they live in their cars in the cold. Well, maybe young people, you begin to think, what is going to happen to us by the time we come out of school? Are we able to afford anything at all? Well, parents, you find that it is very worrisome. Well, maybe for the elderly or um, the, even the young people, you worry about your health. There are all sorts of diseases. It's very, getting very difficult to live in these times. And as you age, you know sudden illnesses are inevitable. You're, you will lose your eyesight, your ability to walk, and you may even lose your memory. All these are ahead of us. There's so much that would trouble our heart, that would make us worry, grieve. Now, the Lord says, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now, I have this question to ask. What do you think is about this, this verse is about? Blessed are they that moan. Richard, what do you think? All right, face sufferings and persecution. What do you mean by sufferings? Pressures in life, like what I mentioned. Okay, all right. Um, Jillian, what do you think it is? What does it mean to moan? Sorry, sorry, I was not accurate. What does it mean to moan? What is mourning over? Sadness. Okay, over what? We can say over persecutions, over pressures and difficulties in life, like I mentioned. Similar. Say again, similar, all right. Last one, uh, Sujin. Okay. 
Okay, too long. Uh, Edward. <laughs> the displeasure about sinfulness of the world. All right, some accurate, some partially accurate, some not accurate. All right, I was totally inaccurate. <laughs> I was trying to mislead you, and hopefully after this you remem remember. This is not about the, well, the pressures of life, of earthly lives where where you're going to have health problems to come, you are going to face financial difficulties because the um, cost of living is going up. Many take this verse to say, wow, you know, it's good to be a Christian. You know, these things are so grieving, so grievous, so difficult. Life is so difficult. Being a Christian, we will be comforted. Well, there are the verses, verses of trusting in the Lord, whatever the Lord allows, but this is not one of them, all right? Well, what about persecution? Yes, there's one of them which we'll study um, later on. Um, what about um, sins of the world? Yes, there's also another aspect. All right, so there are three aspects. One, well, one already mentioned, the, the sins around us, all right? It's the sins in the world. That's one, you see. Um, there's something to mourn over, right? The second one is, we mentioned persecutions because of our faith, all right? Living for the Lord. Um, the sufferings that will come when you're faithful to God. Well, we cover the first one, all right? Um, that, that is, this is the grieving over our sins, all right? So it's our sins, sins around us, in others, in unbelievers as well, in believers, and also in a case where we can go, undergo persecution that will make us grieve, all right? So three aspects in scriptures. So we, and definitely not about, um, well, um, I'm going to fall sick as I grow old, that kind of thing. Now, let us see the application of this word with respect to sin, right? With respect to sin. Now, in fact, this word will, first and foremost, is like, um, Jilan, you mentioned, you're right, um, to grieve over, to, to weep over, to be sad over, all right? To be sorrowful over. So it includes all this. In fact, it is to lament, Lament over sin. We read on, um, on, um, in the case of the children of Israel, after 20 years, they lamented after the Lord, right? There was sorrowing. So there's lamenting. There is grief. Grief. There is sorrow. There is this groaning and sighing. There is even this weeping. Weeping over. Now, in fact, this word is among the different Greek words for for sorrowing, for mourning. It is the strongest word, right? Among the strongest words. It is used to describe at funerals, people wailing, wailing, right? Literally bursting out. They can't control their tears. Sometimes you go to funerals, you see people who have their loved one pass away. They can't contain the sorrow to the point where it, it just, they can't stop. They can't stop sobbing, they stand, can't stop crying. It just comes out, all right? It's that kind of overflowing Grief, overflowing grief. Now, so the Lord says, it is blessed to have this kind of mourning over sin, over sin. Now, let us turn first to James chapter 1, all right? James, James chapter 4, I'm sorry. We'll see this word applied there, right? So we must understand this word. Then we know, well, Lord, this is what I must cultivate, James chapter 4. Now let's read from verses 8 to 10. Reading. 8 to 10. Reading. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double minded. Be afflicted, and moan, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to moaning. And let your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Now here you see in verse 9, moan. Moaning is the same word. And what is it tied to? Moaning over what? Verse 8 tells us about sin. Sin. Sin that have dirtied our hands. Sin that have made our hearts impure. Sins that have made us double-minded, unfaithful to God. Sin. So, in scriptures, it is used to, to describe a moaning, a grieving, a sorrow that is, 
passionately strong in us over our sins, over our sins. Now, let me ask you, Christian, when was the last time you truly grieved over your sins? That you truly, as you look into yourself, are so filled with shame that just the very thought of what you've done, just in your thoughts, how you've treated God, that your face would blush, that you can't lift your head up. Now, remember sometimes when we were, when we were younger, right? Maybe t- the young ones here will understand. You did something terrible at home, right? Disobeyed or something shameful. And then your parents found out. And when, you, when they confronted you, you remember that feeling? When was the last time we felt like that before God? Do you remember studying that God is omniscient, as we've just covered in the book of Isaiah? It's not just for head knowledge. One of the applications was to know that God sees my sin, every sin of mine, my very thoughts, even when I'm sitting here, the secret sins that I have, that are too shameful. But you have to know that God really sees that. He knows. And when we come to Him in prayer, very often even when we come to Him in prayer, there is no this, Lord, I can't, I can't even bring my head up to look at You, Lord. I can't even pray. I'm too ashamed. But we just kneel and then we start praying like, as if nothing much has happened. Now God says the very kind of spirit of moaning is one where the very thought of your sins and how you've disappointed God, how you failed Him, brings so much, so much grief to your heart. Now, this is what it is about. Now, if you look at James, if you're still there, they say, draw nigh to God, and He will draw nigh to you. Then you look at verse 10, and they say, humble yourselves, and He shall lift you up. Now, this is the second part of the beatitude. You will find comfort. For those who cleanse your hands, sinners, purify your hearts, um, you're double-minded, and so on. Now, people who moan and grieve over their sins, now, they will find comfort. In fact, verse 9 tells us, be afflicted and moan. We'll come back to that after this. Be, be. Well, I told you to be like that. Be afflicted and moan and weep. Let your laughter be turned to moaning and your joy to heaviness. Now, today, we live in a world where the contrary is promoted very aggressively, all right? Everything around us, is designed to take our minds away from anything that should make us sad. Everything around you, young people, you must know the games, all right, the activities, um, the the things that they promote to you um, on the internet. Everything is to take your mind to light-heartedness, to take your mind away from anything that makes you look within yourself, right? It's to entertain you. Remember, we studied the word amuse, amuse. Amuse is, or amuse is really amuse. Muse is to think. Muse, muse is to reflect. Muse is to, is to meditate. But amusement, amuse, is literally to take away your reflection within yourself. So it's to keep your mind occupied with all those things. Everything is designed to turn your heart away from this very beatitude. We are full of sin. We know that. We sin against God. So often, we know that. Willingly, unwillingly, knowingly, unknowingly. But we don't have this spirit. The Lord says, blessed are they that moan. Even in churches today, it's the same. Every, um, uh, typically the new uh, new. Um, modern churches in their modern um, worship styles. It's all to, to lift you up, to make you happy. And if you, when you leave the place, you're supposed to be, f- to be filled with exhilaration, feel very good about yourself. N- you should not leave feeling, that, feeling this moaning. If you do, then they feel that they have failed. See, this is very opposite to the second beatitude. So here understand what it is, then, now, we'll come back to this, so put a bookmark there if you want to. Now, turn to 2 Corinthians. Oh, sorry, 1 Corinthians first. 1 Corinthians. 
We see this word um, used again with respect to sin. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Now let's read verses 1 and 2 together. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2 together. Reading. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as it is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather moaned, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. So here you have the word moan. You see, condoning sin, allowing sin around us, within us, among us. When there is sin, God says, you are puffed up. Instead, you are puffed up and have rather, and not rather moan, instead of moaning. You see, that is how we are. Instead of the second beatitude, we are often very um, blasé towards sin, right? Church condone sin, um, leaders condone sin among them, among the leadership. Within the congregation, we live un uh, ungodly lives, worldly, carnal, Christian testimonies, bad testimonies, rather than moaning over our sin. Well, we are puffed up like nothing. It's okay. In fact, this is not serious. This is the very opposite of, of this spirit of moaning, the seriousness, the soberness in our thoughts towards sin. Now then turn to 2 Corinthians, right? Following up the same matter, 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Now let's read verses 8 to 11. So we must learn about this trait first. Then we study the characteristics, all right? 2 Corinthians chapter 7, let's read 8 to 11, reading. For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent. Though I did repent, for I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. For behold, this selfsame thing that ye sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourselves, Ye what indignation, ye what fear, ye what vehement desire, ye what zeal, ye what revenge. In all things, ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Now here, Paul followed up. Paul made them sorry. Paul wanted them to sorrow. Paul rebuked them for condoning sin. Paul rebuked them for not mourning over sin. To the point where, well, they... they really ended up feeling very sorry. And Paul said, I, I was not sorry for making you sorrow, sorrowful over sin. Never. Pastors should never be sorry for making someone sorrowful over their sin. This is exactly what God wants in the second beatitude, that the Word of God is supposed to work that. And look at verse 10, all right? Verse 10. For godly sorrow, this, this mourning over sin, godly sorrow worketh repentance, then, but there is another sorrow. Sorrow of the world worketh death. Sorrow of the world worketh death. Now, what is not this kind of moaning? What is not this kind of moaning? Why did I say this, this um, second beatitude is not about mourning over, well, my health is going to deteriorate one day, I know I'm going to have dementia probably one day, I know probably I'm going to get cancer. So then you get very grieved, very sorrowful. Some people are like that. The thought of well, all these troubles coming, they grieve and they're very sad as they grow older, right? Why do I say it's not about the worry that, oh, how is life going to be? Financially, it's going to be difficult. I think I can't afford a nice place anymore. My dreams are gone. Then now I feel very, 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 very sad, very lousy about life. 
Why do we say it is not that? Because in the Bible, it tells us there is godly sorrow, in verse 10 of 2 Corinthians chapter 7, and there is sorrow of the world, two kinds of sorrow. So it, there are sorrows of the world that will cause us to maybe even have very similar feelings all right, to this godly sorrow. So you must be able to differentiate that and don't live a life in thinking, wow, you know, don't worry. You know, I, our life is very difficult and all that, but because I'm a Christian, God will comfort me. God will bless me one day and, oh, and I will get over these things. I'll be healed. I will be able to afford these things. It is not. There is a godly sorrow that works that works death. Death means it brings nothing spiritual to you. It only brings you to a dead end. That's all. So Christian, we are not called to sorrow over things that, are of the, that, that will just terminate in this world. That is sorrow of the world, all right? Sorrow of the world. Things that just is about the world. Our life in the world for the world. That is all. So, now, I want to make sure that we are clear about this. There are many Christians who read this verse and they feel very comforted, like the elderly, for example, right? They feel that, oh, you know, God wants to comfort me over my health situation. We should learn to submit to God's will, all right? Not expect that God comfort you means God heal you, all right? Will God comfort you? Um, in a sense, yes, He will increase your faith to trust in him but here god is talking about a different kind of sorrow sorrow over sin all right now so young ones please remember this is not about i'm so sad i lost my favorite water bottle all right then you go home you tell daddy mom, mommy daddy i'm so sad today i'm mourning all right i left my water bottle my favorite one from from camp Right, the hope is from Cam and not some Disneyland water bottle. From Cam, and then I lost it. I'm so sad. It's not the kind of things or your favorite toy. All right, your favorite toy got damaged. Your brother or your sister damaged it, and then you are so sad now. Or some drawing that you had, and then someone defaced it. Now you're so sad. This is not that kind of, of being sad over earthly um, losses, things like that. All right. So, young ones, I want you to understand that this is about sin, about sin. Now, the behavior of Ahab, do you remember King Ahab? Young ones, I hope you remember King Ahab. King Ahab, he wanted Naboth's vineyard, right? He wanted Naboth's vineyard. Now, if you don't know the story, tonight you go back, you ask Daddy and Mommy to read the story to you. He wanted Naboth's vineyard and he didn't get it. What did he do? The Bible says he was heavy-hearted, Right? He was, his heart was heavy. He was feeling very down. Now, to the point where his, his appetite was affected, he didn't even feel like eating. All because he wanted the land of someone else, that he wanted to grow his nice, um, nice uh, uh, spices and all that, right? All that he wants, to grow those things. He didn't get it, so he's very angry. Now, adults, it's the same for us. This is not about... I did not get the job that I wanted. Then you feel very sad. And then, oh, I, my, my life's dream was to be this and that. And it did not materialize. And it can't materialize ever again. And then you always just feel, ah, oh, you know, I did not fulfill my life's ambition. This is not about your personal ambitions unfulfilled, your desires unmet. This is not about, I didn't get to marry the person I wanted to marry. And all that kind of things. Right? So, this is not about wounded pride. This is not about a loss of something that made you shameful on earth that, well, I lost. Um, well, some people, they, um, they fall into fornication, then they feel very ashamed. And it is just that, just, just feeling shame for themselves, for their family, that's all. Nothing to do with a godly sorrow over sin, all right? Now, this is not even, and I hope that you understand what I'm saying next, this is not even being mourning over the consequences of sin. I want to say that again. This is not just about mourning over the consequences of sin. This is a mourning over sin. I'm not saying that the consequences of sin should not make us sorrowful, right? But there is a difference between that 
And the Christian simply is sad because of the consequence. That's all. It's not because I have sinned against God. I have, I have grieved the Holy Spirit. I have disappointed God sorely. I failed in my promise to God again. So there is a difference. This is, I want to say again, just because you grieve over the consequence of sin, which is good, we should. Otherwise, the consequence of sin, sin has no effect on us. But it is more than that, right? More than that. So when you bring it together, this is, remember Peter. Peter, after he denied the Lord three times, and he witnessed um, a Christ's reminder come true so clearly, what happened to him? He went out and wept bitterly. He went out and wept bitterly, knowing that he had committed the worst betrayal towards his Saviour who loved him, the Saviour who was so close to him. To him, it was, I've dishonoured God. I've betrayed him. Now, remember in our um, Good Friday service, we learned what is, what is really sin. Sin in many ways is a betrayal of Christ. You look at Christ. You're ashamed of him or you're afraid to bear his name. You're afraid of what might happen. You, you love your uh, own protection more than Christ. And then you, you do something, all right? In disobedience, every sin is, is a great betrayal, a disappointment of God. Children, I'm sure when you sin, disobeying your parents, you have this sense in your heart, and I hope you have. Because if you don't have, I don't know how you will feel when you sin against God that you don't see. You must have this, this, this emotion in your heart, I've disappointed daddy and mommy. I'm so ashamed. Because daddy and mommy, you can see. You can't see God. You don't think of God much through the day. But daddy and mommy, you can see. If you don't have a sense of shame, of, of, of grief, of, of regret. Now, it's the same for the adult. When we sin against God and we don't have that kind of moaning in us, well, we can only say that we are the most shameful of all people. I ask again, dear friends, when was the last time you and I really have this grief in our heart. Grief in few areas we've seen in first, first and Second Corinthians. Well, it is failures towards God. So what do we grieve over? Now we learn. What do we mourn over? Failure towards God. Do you feel sorry for failing God? The church was supposed to maintain the testimony. The church was supposed to show the light, the way of living to the world. They, they have the commandments of God. But when sin occurred in the church, they didn't do anything, let alone moan. They didn't do anything. They failed God. Christian, when we fail God in our testimony, children, when you go to school and you fail God, you know in your heart, you said something, or adults at work, you join in certain, certain things, certain speech that you know just to be part of the crowd, you joke like them, blasphemously, you laugh at certain things just to be part of the crowd, how we fail God, we should be very sorrowful for that. So failures is one. The other one, condoning sin. So Paul rebuked them for condoning sin. We must grieve over that. Now, Christian, we learned over the last few Sundays about how the children of Israel returned to the Lord, and one of the things that, that characterized their return was what? that they returned with their whole heart. And we saw that they got rid of the Baalims and Ashtaroth, means that all the plural, plural, plural male gods, plural female gods, right? They got rid of all of them. Have we learned anything? Since then, have you truly gotten rid of anything? 
Or you just say, oh, you get rid of, well, your major besetting sins. But some sins you think it is not so serious. Well, just spending time uh, watching videos mindlessly or spending time, um, or still listen to certain of the pop music that I used to love and just secretly listen to them. You still have the kind of things that you know that you need to deal with. But you just say, well, I've dealt with my major sins. Now you understand the problem, why the Lord says we don't moan enough. There must be this moaning, Lord, there is still this little one there. There is this little one that the Lord, I have not dealt with it. My heart is so grieved. There, is, there are things that we don't even want to think about it. We just, uh, okay, this sin, I will think about, I will deal with it. The other sin, I, I, I love it too much, I just pretend it is not sin and I don't think about it. Teens, do you have that? The things that you still allow, maybe certain friendships, that you know is drawing you away from God. But I just don't want to deal with this particular thing. Well, whatever it is. So, condoning sin. As long as we, we know that is something... Now, I'm not talking about sinless perfection. Please be clear about that. There's no sinless perfection on earth. But as long as we know we are not what we should be and we could be by the grace of God and we are aware of it and we don't be that and there is no grief, then we are not what the Lord says, blessed are those that moan, condoning sin, all right? Not just failures, but condoning sin, condoning sin. Now, the theme this year is about prayer, Right? We're going to go to camp to learn about prayer. Please pray that the Lord will speak to us. But let me ask you, we've preached on prayer here and there through the year. We memorize it every other week at our fellowship. But let me ask you, have you been praying? Have you been praying to him that knoweth? But you know that is good and you don't do it, that is sin. Have you truly made the changes in your life? Or you just say, I've always not really prayed that much. It's, it's no big deal. And that is what God is talking about here. Moan over your failures. Moan over things that you know that you should deal with but you have not dealt with. Fathers, you know that you have not been the father that you should be. You still try to hide and not think about this like we learned on Sunday. There are many excuses for... for for things that we don't do, right? Instead of moaning, we hide behind certain things. There's no grief. In fact, when, when our family members don't find out about it, other Christians don't find out about it, pastors don't find out about it, we are happy. Instead of moaning, we are happy. You see, there is no, there is no, there is no, this word moan here. There is no desire to hide. That's one of the characteristics. There is just the outbursting. When you, when you, like when this word is used at funerals, for example, all right? But this is not about, about funerals, all right? When this word is at, used at funerals, at funerals, you don't feel that someone need to feel that I need to hide my tears. You don't, you don't see someone feeling that I need to hide this emotion. They let it out, right? They don't, they don't feel that I need to hide. To, to them, expressing the emotion, it's what they need to do. So there is, there is no, no shame. Now it's very rare to hear a Christian as they ponder upon their own lives and they reflect upon their own lives and they look back in their own lives and they remember the grievous sin that they've sinned against the Lord and they're filled with shame and sorrow and grief. Very rare. Well, if you go through that, you are blessed. You are blessed. Now, I'm not saying there's, there's this morning to no end. Huh? When we learn about comfort, we'll learn what it is about. But this is where it begins, my friend. There is this deep lamenting, deep lamenting, lamenting that you have offended God. God, I've offended you. No, we are more, we, have, we feel more grief and regret and sorrow when we offend people. But sin is an offense against God. Do you feel, when you offend God, do you feel so terrible about it? We just say, oh God, sorry, eh? sorry about that. 
oh, please forgive me. Oh God, now, you know, about my work, I need your help. It's like that, right? That's how we pray. There is no this brokenness and contrition at all, right? So this is what God is talking about. So what is this sorrowing over? A sorrow for offending God, a sorrow for disappointing God, a sorrow for um, that now my fellowship is separated, or rather say my fellowship is affected. My fellowship, my, my fellowship God is, if it's God, is affected. Does that trouble you? Does that make you sorrowful? Peter was in deep grief, right? And he was ashamed, ashamed to meet Christ again, and he wondered what it will it be. But yet, he wanted to, be, to see Christ. He ran. He ran and ran and ran. With a heart that said, hopefully, well, if it's a reason, there is at least an opportunity for me to express, express my, my shame, my sorrow to him. Let me run to him, right? There is that, a desire to have this closeness. When we go through the day and we sin and we sin and we sin, we don't even link it to the fact that God is displeased and, and we, have, we are betraying him, we are disappointing him, we are offending him, we are grieving him, and we go on like it's fine, right? So, but I want to say also it is not mainly that, all right? It's not mainly about your fellowship is broken, that's why you feel grief. I think the most important thing is that the child of God knows that I have, I have offended God, I have failed him. I'm a disappointment to him. How can I, how can I do that against the God who loved me and died for me? That is what must grieve us, all right? It's not just, well, fellowship restored, yay, and that's it. Even after the fellowship is restored. Now, that is the next characteristic we want to learn, all right? So, the characteristic of, now we come to the characteristics, all right? Now, the first characteristic, there is a self-loathing, self-loathing, a hating of self. The world tells you to love yourself. Christian theology today is love yourself. If you don't love yourself, you don't know how to love God, love others. Now, how do we know that is this self-loathing? You don't have to turn there. We've covered that in great detail. Isaiah 6, 5 to 7. Woe is me, woe is me, for I am undone, because I'm a man of unclean lips. Woe is me. That is the self-loathing. The world doesn't want you to have any self-loathing. You must love yourself very much. But the Bible is opposite. When it comes to our sin, do we really say, Woe is me, I am undone. Why? Because I am a man of uncleanness, because of my sin. The indwelling sin in me that often caused me to be unclean. I am undone. I, I, I hate all this. There's a self loan. Woe is me. I am, I am undone. Do you have that? So Christian, there is this place where God says, blessed are those. Blessed are those that moan. Now, is it surprising that this is the second beatitude? What's the first one? All right? The first one is about, well, our, our brokenness and our contrition. Correct? our humbleness, our humility before that, like a beggar, someone who is so poor in spirit. And one of the areas we learned was poor in spirit with respect to the feeling that there is no good in me. I am saved by grace. That is all. There is no good. No matter how spiritual I walk in this life, there is no good in me. I am such, such an unclean person. Now, these prophets who Isaiah, woe is me. He is so holy. The apostle Paul, he is so, so godly, all right? Oh, but yet there is, there is this self-loathing. Paul says, there's no good thing in me. Naturally leads to this. Naturally leads to this. Second beatitude. With that, with that feeling of I, I am, there's no goodness in me. There's so much sin that dwells in me all the time during the day. Oh, how I loathe myself, right? So that's one characteristic that we see from scriptures about this morning. 
So it's not just, I feel sad, I weep a bit and that, and that kind of thing. Well, I think today I experience moaning. No, there is this, I really can't stand myself. When you pray, you kneel before God, Lord, I am really so, so, so terrible, I don't think I am fit even to kneel before you now. But I thank you that through Christ, I can be cleansed. But even when I know that I'm cleansed, yet it's so, I'm so clear in my heart, I'm so unclean. Now then the next one, there must be the hatred of sin. There must be the hatred of sin. So it is not just, ah, I've sinned again, but there is a hatred of sin. Well, how do we know that, all right? Now in 2 Corinthians, when they repented, and Paul said, for godly sorrow worketh repentance. And then he said a whole string of things. Ye sorrowed after a godly thought. Now you moan. You have the genuine spirit of moaning. All right? The beatitude moaning. You sorrowed, ye sorrowed after a godly thought. Then they said, what carefulness it wrought, what clearing of yourself, what indignation. Right? What indignation. Through moaning, not only loathes yourself, Lord, I am so loathsome. True moaning has this indignation against sin. And then he says, what vehement desire, what zeal, what revenge. Right? You hate that sin and say, now I got rid of you. What revenge? So there is that moaning. So it is not just, well, you weep and then you feel sorry and then you listen to some hymns and then you cry when you sing. Then after that, you go away feeling nothing much about that sin. No, that is that every thought of that sin, every sight of that sin makes you, f makes you f feel with, with indignation and, and hating it, all right? So that is that moaning. Do we have that? We go through life happy, go lucky. Even when besetting sins are in our lives. So it's abstaining from sin. So we see from 2 Corinthians, abstaining from sin, abhorring of sin, and abandoning of sin. So this morning, later when we study why, why is blessed, it creates all that kind of, of um, attitude towards sin. Do we have that? All right? So this is what there must be. Then it is joined with repentance. All right? The third characteristic of this is, is joined with repentance. For godly sorrow worketh repentance. Not to be repented of. All right? Godly sorrow work with repentance to salvation. Remember the word salvation is not just being saved from the penalty of sin, from the power of sin, all right? That is why after that, say, what, we, what indignation, right? What clearing of yourself? What salvation it wrought in you? So this kind of moaning brings repentance, genuine repentance. Peter went out and he wept bitterly. So did Judas. So did Judas. But Judas was a sorrow of the world. It did not work repentance. It should, work, should have worked repentance in his heart, but instead, he just felt very bad. That is all. There is no sorrow that I've sinned against God. He just felt bad that, ah, because of me now, this man died. That is all. Right? There was no, I sinned against the living God. I have offended God. I failed God. And I am, this sorrow is towards God. But his was a sorrow towards himself. He took the money back. Instead of going to God, he took the money back, take back the money. Say, so what is it for us? No, nothing to us. So instead of turning to God in sorrow, he just wanted to, to get things, clear his conscience towards men. That's all. So there is this godly sorrow that works repentance towards God. Now these are some of the characteristics. Some of the characteristics. Now then we close as we turn back to James. All right, turn back to James chapter 4. James chapter 4. James chapter 4. Now here... In verse 9, all right, James chapter 4, verse 9. Actually, in verse 8, you see the same thing, all right? This morning, there is the cleansing of hands, purifying of hearts. Now, the double-mindedness is really the, 
the unfaithfulness to God, all right? Failing God in that sense. So unfaithfulness to God is something that must make us moan. All the promises that we made to God, my friends, remember all the promises, Lord, I won't go back to this sin anymore. Lord, I will pray more. Lord, I promise I'll do my quiet time. Lord, I promise this and that. And then we fail again and again. Has there been sorrow? Has there been, then been shame and grief? Can you imagine, spouse, your husband keeps telling you, or your wife keeps telling you, I promise not to commit adultery again. I promise you. And then they moan, they cry and everything. And then they do it again and again and again and again. But that's us, right? There is no genuine sorrow. Now, look at verse 9. Be afflicted and moan. Right? So it's be afflicted and moan and weep and let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Now, this is what the Lord says. Blessed are they that moan. In other words, here James elaborates on it. Cultivate this beatitude. Cultivate this beatitude. Be afflicted and moan and weep and let your laughter be turned to mourning. Do it. So God says, blessed are they that moan. God is not saying, well, did you moan? Or, you didn't feel any mourning. Or, nothing much you, oh, sorry, nothing much you can do. So nothing much. It's okay. You didn't moan. No, this is, this be. Blessed are. So this is something to be cultivated in us. It's not God, you didn't make me feel that way. But here, the word of God says now, be afflicted. Afflict ourselves. Now, God willing, next week, we study more of verse 9. How to have this this spirit of moaning. How? Because we are told, be afflicted. What should I do? God, I don't have it. But now I realize it is, it is it's absent in me. How to have this blessed spirit of moaning? Let us turn to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, O oh Lord, as we search our own hearts, Lord, we, if you're honest, we can, we can safely say that we know very little of this beatitude. Lord, we take sin so lightly. We take offending you, disappointing you, failing you, committing adultery against you, betraying you. Lord, all so lightly. There is very little grief, shame, sorrow, feeling, oh Lord, how can we sin against the God of love? Oh Lord, we need this in our life. So Father, we pray that you teach us more about this. And even as we go back tonight, oh Lord, to really reflect in our own hearts, where are we in this spirit? Father, we pray that you meet with us in the place of prayer. Lord, we are poor, we are needy, we are unable to do anything without you. And that church work is so dependent on you. There are so much things that can go wrong, they can fail, that we can fall. Likewise, for thy people, may thou be merciful to meet with us and hear our cries. We ask and pray for all this in Jesus' name. Amen.